if we left the house, we would die. They're constantly being watched. He's sowing the seeds of fear. It's fair to say that I manipulated her. You can only imagine what might happen to her if she gets caught. My name is Katie Morgan Davies. I was born into a cult. I was not able to escape till the age of 30. This is how I did it. There were around a dozen cult members. We all lived in the house together, and I was the only child. It was a Maoist collective, and then at some point, it moved from being a radical communist um, group to becoming a personality cult. Listening to Katie's story, it's really horrific what she's been through. I imagine that some of her experiences and feelings would be quite typical for people who grow up in a cult. Usually there's this massive sense of insecurity and anxiety and fear. The cult was run by my father, Aurobindan Balakrishnan. I knew him as Comrade Bala or AB. I just remember everybody being scared of him, having to show him unnatural levels of deference, which he didn't reciprocate. My father used to tell his followers that he was God. Bad things would happen to people if they went against him, or that if he willed it, bad things would ha could happen anywhere in the world. We were expected to sing songs. He wrote songs about himself. Titles like, do what you want if you want to die. Do as AB says if you want to live. Are you on AB's side or are you on the side of fascist state? Or... When we look at the psychological makeup of a typical cult leader, they tend to be quite grandiose and also quite paranoid. And the other thing that's quite typical in cult leaders, and again, I think we're seeing this in Balakrishnan, is becoming a malignant narcissist. I remember Hours spent listening to him long lectures and long rants. Other cult members used to just be forced to stand up for hours. Sometimes people used to pass out. He's putting them in this space where they're so distracted with, the, with their physical situation that they don't have the time or the space to question what's going on, why they're saying or doing the things that they're doing. I wasn't allowed to go to school. I wasn't allowed to see a doctor or a dentist. Not even allowed to look out of the window in case I saw something which made me question what was going on in the house. Comrade Bala told us that if we left the house, we would die. And I remember later on being told that I would spontaneously co combust if I left the house on my own. It might be easy for people to assume that Katie or other cult members might be a bit naive perhaps from believing that they will spontaneously combust, but we have to realise that this was hammered into her since she was a young child. At that stage in her life, she didn't have any reason to doubt what her father was telling her. He said he had a mind control machine called Jackie, and it was an invisible machine as well, so you couldn't see it. When AB used to use violence against us, he used to say that actually he was protecting us from the wrath of Jackie. Jackie would have done something 100 times worse to us. We were actually meant to be thankful for being beaten up by AB rather than facing the anger of Jackie. And what I was told was that I was being kept safe. I was sickly and I couldn't stop vomiting. So AB decided that the way to kind of make me better is to step, up, step on my face. That was meant to be safe. Hearing Katie talk about those horrible experiences, a couple of things jump out to me. Balakrishnan is clearly using violence as a form of coercive control. So he's using fear within the community. But on top of that, he's actually gaslighting Katie. Gaslighting is where you convince the victim that you're actually helping them or protecting them or it's the victim's fault. He's sowing the seeds of fear into Katie and other cult members that they're constantly being watched and that their actions might have repercussions even when Balakrishnan isn't present. Everybody was a spy for him. So if you said something wrong or you didn't say something which you were meant to say, someone would have a quiet word in his ear and report you and then it was somebody else's turn to take revenge a few w days or weeks later. What Katie is describing to me seems like this huge atmosphere, this tense atmosphere driven by paranoia and this is very conniving and it's very manipulative from Balakrishnan because even if he's not present people don't feel that they can they can act outside of the confines of the rules. When you look at Katie's situation, the brainwashing, the indoctrination, the resistance for her to actually think freely, it must be extremely difficult, almost impossible, for her to actually have that spark of an idea to be independent and to want to escape. I had read Lord of the Rings. There was a character called the Witch King who had turned into an absolute monster. I had a, a dream. The people I was 
running up to looked at me in absolute horror. When I looked back into the into a glass pane, I saw a witch king looking back at me. That made me see that if I carried on staying in this place, I would just end up becoming like them. And I thought, you know, there's no way I'm going to carry on living in this place where you have to behave like a twat, you know, I'm not doing it. In 2009, one of the cult members felt very bullied. She was crying all the time and feeling very unwell a lot of the time. She used to get reported in the way she used to report me and she couldn't stand it anymore. I saw that if I developed a relationship with this particular cult member, I would be able to have an opportunity to escape from there. We used to cook together and she used to make really nice food. So I used to say how much I loved her cooking and obviously when she was being bullied, I used to hug her and listen to her and support her when everybody else was ganging up on her. It's fair to say that I manipulated her. I manipulated her. What I think is ingenious is the way that Katie finds a loophole in the system. She needs to find a member of the cult to connect with. Firstly because she needs the emotional support and also because if and when the opportunity becomes available, she'll probably need some help to actually escape. So how does she do this? Well, she finds somebody who herself might be quite vulnerable, somebody who has been targeted, who has suffered a lot of insults and a lot of abuse, and she shows that person some empathy, some sympathy, and she forms a connection with them. By forming this alliance, this is an absolutely vital step in Katie's plan to outsmart Balakrishnan. I said that I want to leave this house by the end of 2014, and I will leave this house alive or dead. This cult member had realised what how the gravity of the situation and decided to try to help me. Another thing that I did was when we were going to the laundrette, I used to be given lots of coins for the washers and dryers. Whatever remained, I stashed it away. So over five years, I managed to save up 200 pounds. I suggested that we should buy a secret mobile phone so that we could communicate with the outside world. This cult member bought one on one of her shopping excursions and sneaked it into the house. With Katie obtaining a mobile phone, possibly one of the first times ever in her life, she actually has a lifeline. She has a means of communicating with this vast, scary, unknown outside world. We used to have to watch the six o'clock news every day, Monday to Friday. One day, there was an item on forced marriages and underneath there was a helpline. So myself and this other cult member, we memorized the number and then the next day, we called the number on the secret mobile phone. They managed to arrange to collect us on the 25th of October 2013 when A.B. and his wife were going shopping. She's on the cusp of potentially escaping, which must be really exciting for her, but also terrifying because things can still go wrong. She could be found with a mobile phone, her so-called allies might turn against her. We have to understand that this is in the context of the potential repercussions. If Balakrishnan stamps on her head just for being sick, you can only imagine what might happen to her if she gets caught. So it's extremely brave. These people who were picking us up waited around the corner. At 11.15, me and my companion left the house. We were greeted by this couple, put our bags into the boot and we were off. He thought that nobody would ever be able to successfully challenge him and he was complacent about that. He thought I was just a silly little girl who could do nothing without the cult, that I would never be able to get out of there, but I did. A.B. was sentenced to 23 years in prison. I felt vindicated, but at the same time I felt really sad because I never wanted it to come to that. I didn't want I didn't want my dad to be in jail, I just wanted to be free. I've been in prison for too long to voluntarily be in prison with anger and hatred. What really strikes me is how magnanimous Katie was about the whole situation after it ended. She says that she didn't even want her father, who put her under horrific torture for decades, let's not forget, uh, to get in trouble. She didn't really seem to take any credit for her own bravery. She didn't seem to acknowledge that she's ended all the suffering. So it just really goes to show what an amazing person Katie is and this capacity for compassion that she has and she's able to show her father.